come to the front. Let's continue our worship with prayer. Can I pray for us? Bow your hearts with me. Father, we approach you. We approach you with confidence because of what Jesus did, because of who he is. We approach the throne of grace with confidence because we love you. We recognize that we need you and that we're desperate for you. You are the source of life, abundant and eternal. There is no other. We need you. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and approach God? Father, we approach you as one body today. We thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for being a great father, our true, our true father, our creator, redeemer, sustainer. You are the beginning in all. You are the beginning and end of all things, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and end of our lives. And we thank you for Jesus. Because of him, there is no end. We will know you for eternity. What a wonderful thought. As we worship you with thanksgiving, we give you this offering today. We give you our, thanks, our thankful hearts. And as we continue to worship you in song and with the inquiry of your word, we wish that you would be glorified, you and you alone. Amen. I'm pretty sure I never said any of those things. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Shut the door. Were you born in a barn? That's the proper way you say that. And no, money doesn't grow on trees. So, enough of that. Our first song is, This is My Father's World. And we picked it because it's you know, Father's Day. But as you hear the lyrics, as you sing them, they're... In a little way, they're kind of light. You think, well, there's not a lot of doctrine in here. Well, the guy who wrote this was a pastor who passed away in 1901 at the age of 42. And he lived up uh, around Niagara Falls. And he would often tell his wife, uh, I'm going out for a walk to see my father's world. And so he wrote the poem uh, before he passed away. And then a few years later, one of his friends put it to music. And it ends with, the battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be won. But as I thought about this 
song which talks about my father's world and the birds and, and all this, I thought of Romans 1, verse 20, where it says, For since the creation of the, wor of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So in our Father's world, creation shows the power of God. It shows the sovereignty of God. So as we sing this, you know, we can think about our wonderful creator who gave us this world. So let's stand together. It's hymn number 31 in your hymnal if you'd like to use that. This is my Father's world. so strong, and boy, doesn't it, in our world today, God is the ruler yet. This is our Father's world. Let's continue to worship by singing, Speak, O Lord. Yeah. 
time of prayer. Lord, our Father in heaven, happy Father's Day. Thank you for being our Father and for directing our steps regardless of the plans we make for ourselves. Thank you for your Holy Spirit to guide us. Also, thank you for safety through this storm we had in the area this week. Um, I didn't hear of any injuries there and lead us there's a lot of people with a lot of damage buildings and stuff um, yeah if you would have for us to help them make it clear to us open our eyes to it thank you for your love your mercy and your grace we pray for our dear pastor this morning as he comes up to bring us your message and pray for everyone here that we can cleanse our minds and hear what you have for us this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our debts, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. It is good to see you all again today, and uh, as we do come up on Father's Day, I do want to also say happy Father's Day to all the dads. Uh, Speaking of the the storm, I know that maybe a number of you have had some damage, and uh, we're grateful, as was prayed, that uh, no one lost their lives or major injuries. Of course, things can be fixed and replaced, but uh, we're, we're grateful that no one passed away because of that. Recently, we've talked about uh, common suffering, if you recall. There's common grace, and that is God causes the sun to shine on believers in him and those that hate him and reject him. Um, He he causes the rain to fall on farmers in the area that believe in Jesus the Christ and those farmers that reject Jesus the Christ. He, He gives common grace that way. There's also common suffering. So in this storm, there were people who were believers in Christ that had you know, damage to their property and those who were believers and those who weren't. And so uh, we all will struggle in this life with various trials and challenges and persecutions and things as Christians, um, but we we don't want to be discouraged. And I know there've been many folks out helping one another and we had a couple big trees come down in our our backyard and some of you had quite a bit yourself. So, you know, what what does it teach us? What do we learn from it? We learn that um, this world has fallen, uh, that uh, these things are temporal. Um, You know, if if all the things uh, that we had blew away, uh, they're temporal, we would, by God's grace, uh, rebuild and carry on. But it gives us an interesting perspective, does it not? These, God allows us to go through these storms 
to show us that his eternal things are, are fixed and solid. And when you stand spiritually on Jesus the rock, the world can rage and things that you have can be blown away, taken away. Even your life could be lost. But if you're in Christ, you're on the solid rock. And those eternal things cannot be taken away, no matter what. So it's just a little perspective for us today. And it's interesting, the song we, we sang, This Is My Father's World. Yes, there are so many beautiful things of the world, you know, the butterflies and the birds and trees, and oh, I love all that stuff. It's so fascinating. But let us not forget that, that God also did curse his creation, and he broke his creation during the flood of Noah's day, absolutely through and through broke the earth. Um, earthquakes and tornadoes, and what we experienced, the storm we had, friends, is not the original paradise planet. Um, I used to travel and teach on this, and um, it's important to understand that the Grand Canyon, the mountain ranges we see today around the world, all the physical features of the world are post-flood. They're really testaments to God's judgment on sin. Are they majestic? Yep, the mountains are majestic. But I think as we look up to them, we see that's a massive amount of rock that was once sediment under the floodwaters. And as they collided and the continents grew up out of the floodwaters, it ought to humble us in the sense of this is our Father's world and He is willing to break it because of sin. But then he's willing to do what? Send his son to take on human flesh and all the beautiful things we talk about all the time. And Jesus the Christ lived that sinless life, went to the cross for us, not only to bring about the forgiveness of sins and the payment for sins. Yes, that is true. But friends, he will redeem the entire creation. We, we forget that sometimes. This is a beautiful world in many ways. Yes, but do never forget it is broken because of sin. And yet, God will one day give us a paradise earth where there's no more storms. Like what we just went through, no more. No more disease, no more death. No more cancer, no more crying, no more pain. That old order is gone. And who do we thank for that? God, yes, but specifically Jesus the Christ who went to the cross to do all of these things for us. So we'll look at that today. All scripture today, as you see on the screen, all scripture is breathed out by God and has some purpose for us. So what a, what a wonderful thing to think about today. We're going to do that just now. Let's uh, open our text then to 2 Timothy. You can tell we're working through this passage, uh, and I will not never apologize for carefully going through it. There's so much here. And friends, even in this one phrase on the screen today, there's so much truth to this. So we will spend for sure today, we may spend another Sunday, maybe two, Maybe three, maybe four. Um, but there's some really amazing things just in this last section of our, our passage that AJ read for us earlier. So we'll take a look today at this particular thing. So as we begin, here's what we're going to cover in the green. We're going to talk once again about the, notice the the is capitalized. In this case, it is a specific writing or writings, specific We'll talk about it a little bit later, but documents that fallen sinful human beings write, a lot of times will have some value and merit uh, to them. Laws and various things, yes, they, they are good, but they are not sacred writings. So what, what in the world do we mean by the sacred writings? We'll look at that briefly here. And then the other green that you see on the screen there, all scripture. Uh, so all scripture is also in view here by Paul. And a very curious thing that it says is breathed out by God. So that tells us that these writings are very special, more special than any other writings in the whole world of all history. So today we've come to understand what is all Scripture for you and me today? What is it? It's, it's the Old Testament and the New, correct? It's these things on the screen. The synonyms for the sacred writings and Scripture include God's Word, Bible, sacred writings, which as Don shared with us in, in the Sunday school, you know, that is the Old Testament primarily. More on that in a minute. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have, it's called the Word of God, words of God. Logos would be Word of God. It's like the entire package. Words of God include the word, the word rema, which is, means the, the words, individual words that make up the entire book. So that's kind of neat. So God is concerned not only with the entire Bible, but he's, in, he's also interested in the words that are used. So you often hear me say, friends, this word is very important. 
And of course, a lot of it was in Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew for the Old Testament. But the very words that the Holy Spirit breathed out into the minds of the men that wrote, the very words are specific and they are important. And we also hear it called the word of Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So all of these things are, are synonymous uh, with one another. The one caveat could be sacred writings back in the day referred to the Old Testament. But of course, now you and I could rightly say, AJ, couldn't we, that the sacred writings do include the New Testament. They really do. All right? So that's what we're looking at today. Scripture, God's word. Today, all scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, and then this, in the yellow. So in Timothy's day, it's important to establish this before we move on. In Timothy's day, the sacred writings, again, as I just said, but I want to reiterate this to make sure we get it, was this right here in this paragraph. Among the Greek-speaking Jews of that day, the Jewish scriptures, our Old Testament, was referred to as the sacred writings. And so you think, well, why is that important? Here's why. Paul tells us that Timothy had heard what growing up? the sacred writings. Timothy had been taught by his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice from the Old Testament. And it, it says right in here, Paul says, Timothy, because you learned those things, it made you wise unto what? Or toward what? Salvation in Jesus the Christ. And if you recall, we, we spent those four years in a sermon series on the road to Emmaus for that very reason. Because Jesus is found in the Old Testament He's woven, some have said he's woven like a scarlet thread of redemption through the entire thing. And we talked about the foreshadowing in Moses and, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Remember that? Joshua is actually Jesus' name in English. So it's, Jesus is Greek. Joshua is the English. Yeshua, the Hebrew. And so Joshua, the son of Nun in the Old Testament, was a foreshadow of Joshua the Christ. And we, we, we laid all that out back in the day. And it's, it's so important to do so. Because here we see Paul saying, those Old Testament writings, Ripley Church, are important. So don't shun them, forsake them. Don't, don't try to take them out of the Bible. But you need the Old Testament, the sacred writings. And in this, um, in this text that we see on the screen there, the paragraph uh, with, includes the Bible verse. It says that Timothy from childhood was acquainted with those Old Testament writings. It's interesting because that word literally means from infancy. They think, and I talked to Tiffany quite a bit, and she's dealt with kids at various ages, right? So a little baby infant that hardly, it can't even understand language. Uh, you think, well, is that what that means? I think what it means is uh, all the way from the beginning, as soon as they can begin to communicate, you begin to try in various levels that they can comprehend to speak to them of the spiritual truth. Uh, you're not going to take a four-year-old and try to explain to them you know, things about God's sovereign election and man's responsibility, right, Tiffany? He's not going to do that. But you're certainly going to start them out understanding the double-edged sword, that they are sinners and they need a savior. And you think, really, pastor? Yes. Uh, with my kids uh, at a young age, Jana and I would often tell them, we would say, you're being pretty good kids. And then jokingly, but yet truthfully, we would add, for little sinners. But because we had begun to teach them that they were sinners, even from youngest age when they could comprehend it. And it's still kind of a, I should maybe say it's a joke, but it's a running ha-ha in our family to say that you're, you're pretty good for a little sinner. You see, that communicates to kids. It puts in their mind, oh, yes, it is true. I am a sinner, and I need a Savior. And then mom and dad have taught me that that is Jesus the Christ and him alone. You see the point. So you can start with kids at very uh, young ages and, and get them the truths that they need. So for Timothy, that's what happened to him. And friends, that's why he was ready. He was ready. So in this text, it, it talks about who taught Timothy. Yes, it was grandmother Lois. It was mother Eunice. But who else came through on the missionary journey? Paul did. Paul came through and he took the Old Testament and helped Timothy and Lois and Eunice to understand Jesus the Christ by name and then help them apply the Old Testament to, to the new. It brings up a question. Maybe you're not asking the question today. What about the Old Testament people, though? How were they saved? No different than today. The people from the Old Testament era would have heard from Genesis through Malachi being taught to them as it was a completed document. 
And by the way, in Jesus' day, the, the sacred writings, the Old Testament was, was a very common document. They had those scrolls. Uh, every local synagogue would have a copy of the Old Testament. So these folks were learning from Genesis through Malachi. And it, it reveals in there God's holiness, his majesty, his patience, his love. Yes, even in the Old Testament, his love. Even though God did pour wrath out on sin from time to time, as an example, he was loving and gracious and he offered forgiveness and salvation for those that trusted in himself and not in themselves. Does that make sense, Bill? So even in the Old Testament, they weren't, they weren't supposed to trust in their own self-righteousness, right? Because as we're learning in Sunday school, it didn't exist, did it? They didn't have self-righteousness, neither do I, neither do you. Even for the Old Testament believers, they understood that and they, they threw themselves on the mercy of their creator God. Many of them did know of a coming promise, as was told to Abraham. Listen to these passages a minute. Listen to this. John 8 says this, although their spiritual understanding was limited, the scriptures say this, they understood their father Abraham rejoiced to see Christ's day. He saw it and was glad. That's what the New Testament tells us. Abraham understood what God had revealed to him, and he rejoiced to see Christ's day. And he saw it and was glad. God gave Abraham an ability, a vision, if you will, to see what was down the road. And he was glad because of it. And Hebrews 11 says, Moses, who considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Isn't that interesting? Moses could have lived in Pharaoh's court, right? And Barney, he could have had it all in the world's terms, right? Riches, wealth, power, prestige, respect and admiration of the people. But it says in the New Testament that Moses himself considered the reproach of Christ, meaning to follow the true God and the coming Christ as better than having all the worldly wealth. So we see from the New Testament that they even had concept of Jesus to come and they put their faith in this God. So they were saved by faith, not by works. And so Don's leading us in Sunday school through, why was the, the Old Testament moral law given? You know the law, right? Don't covet, don't lie, don't murder. Why would God give that? Well, it tells us. Paul goes on to teach us that it was intended to set a righteous standard so high, no one could keep it. And some of us would cry foul. Well, that's not fair. Why would God do it? God did it because Adam and Eve had already rebelled. The law was given to prove, accentuate, demonstrate that we all, are, we all are sinners and we are in big, big trouble. So that's why God gave the law in the Old Testament. So, you know, Eunice, Lois, Timothy would have, would have heard and read in, in the scrolls in the synagogues, they would have heard taught to them the fact that the law was given and they would have heard the accounts of how the Israelites were given a covenant, but they couldn't keep it. And then they would realize that they couldn't keep God's law either. Then as Paul comes along and says, no one is righteous, no, not one. They would go, yes, we got that from the Old Testament text. And then Paul would proceed to tell them of one who was, is righteous and who died for their sins, that's Jesus the Christ. So those two things came together at that time. To finish out the rest of our, our thought this, this morning on the gospel, since no one is self-righteous by keeping God's law, it showed everyone doomed by guilt and sin. And so everyone is desperate for forgiveness. Then we learn that the Old Testament animal sacrifices did not save the Jews. Very clear from Scripture, Old and New Testament. But it showed the fact that their sin demanded death, right? Their sin, the Jews' sin, demanded death. Our sin demands death. And Jesus the Christ, of course, died the death that he died for us as that perfect lamb. So that is, it in a nutshell, that the, the folks would have learned, Lois and Timothy and Eunice would have learned these Old Testament principles that made them wise and ready for salvation as Paul came along. And then this slide, let's think about this a minute. These three and others, that's what et all means, others. So Lois, Eunice, Timothy, and others were some of the first to have both the Old Testament or sacred writings. They already had learned them learn from those, and then they also heard the truths of Jesus from Paul before they were even written down as New Testament. Think about that, how wonderful that those three and others were right at the juncture where they had heard the Old Testament all those years being taught to them, and now as Paul traveled around, and others as well, of course, other missionaries, they were hearing about Jesus 
these folks, even before the New Testament was brought together. What a, and then I put this thought down. Think of God's grace and his timing to those three and others, that they were allowed to live in such a time of history to see the coming together of old and new. And then all of us today, we have this treasure. We have this glorious treasure of God's completed, completed work. Vince, does anything else need to be added to this for you to understand salvation? He gets it. He says, no, he's, you're right. Nothing else needs to be added to this document. This is the document, the most important document of the planet ever. And it's been given to us graciously by God as a gift. We hold a great treasure in our hands. Wonderful thought. These folks were at the bringing together of the two. It was codified early on in church history. It means brought together and made as one unit over time. And then we have that treasure today. Sadly, many folks still don't care, reject it. They're willing to get on the internet and read, 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 read about whatever, but um, not interested in God's word. So I encourage us all, let's be interested in God's word. It's a treasure. It's vital to our salvation. Let's go back to this. Go back to the the text. What does it mean, breathed out by God? A wonderful uh, statement. We understand what all means in the text, right? All? All? So, uh, Pastor Eric, does does that mean Leviticus? Yeah, Leviticus is crucial scripture. Uh, What about the little tiny book of Philemon? Yes. Again, all scripture. Even the accounts in here that show the utter darkness and depravity of folks in the Old and New Testament. Are those scriptures, should they be in here? Yes, they should. God is teaching us through those things as well. And pointing to the fact that So Denise, in the Old Testament, were any of the prophets perfect? No, all sinners, all fell short. Any of the kings? No. Any of the other positions of religious leadership? Nope, they all fell short. All of that in the Old Testament was put in there to say all of man's attempts at being the perfect savior is going to fall flat and fall short. But who is the king that is perfect? Jesus. Who is the prophet that is perfect? Jesus. Which apostle is perfect? The scriptures call Jesus an apostle, a sent one. It's Jesus. And so even the Old Testament, all scripture shows the sinfulness of man and then points gloriously to Jesus, our savior. Scripture very simply is the word graphe and it means writing. And in our case, it's the entirety of the Bible. All right, so what's this breathed out by God uh, understanding? The word theopneustos, theos is God and pneuma, the other word is breath. It, it can mean a uh, breath of life in like a, an animal or a person. But then also in the right context, it is the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God is referred to as the pneuma of God, breath of God. And it's interesting, uh, we're going to develop this in, in a little bit, but think on the human level for a second. As we're talking about words and communication, uh, on a human level, a person with a mind... So I do have a mind, it's there. Uh, I'll think of words to communicate and then using the body parts like the breath, the ribs work together with the lungs and uh, the lips and the, the, the tongue. I am able to take the thoughts and speak them into words that hopefully I can speak clearly enough that you know maybe Chad will understand me, right Chad? All right. And so on a human level, we think about communication. And I can communicate to Chad principles, truths, various things. And now let's apply that thought to God. God is the original communicator, is he not? We see that the Godhead thinks. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there's thinking going on, there's a mind, and then there's communication. There's speaking and communication within the Godhead. And then God can communicate to angels, and he can communicate to to people as well, of course. So one of the roles of the Holy Spirit, I love to think about the different roles of the Godhead. So is God three gods or one? One God, three persons. Of the three persons, whose role was it to become Jesus the man, Joshua the man? Father, Son, or Spirit? You say it. The Son. The Father, we would say his role is to be, he's the Father, he is the head, he's the source of all. The Holy Spirit then, what are some of the roles of the Holy Spirit? From Genesis, and uh, I'm thinking of Genesis 1, the creation account. I'm thinking of uh, Samson, 
What was the source bill of Samson's strength? Spinach? He ain't Popeye. So what was the source of Samson's strength where he could take a jawbone of a, of a deceased donkey and he just went through and he defeated a thousand men at one shot? Holy Spirit. The scripture says the Holy Spirit came upon him and he was filled with the strength to do what God called him to do. So very quickly we see one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is the power giver. And that's true of New Testament. Who is our power, Ammon, at, to live the Christian life? You know this, the Holy Spirit. Ammon is a believer in Jesus the Christ. He knows he's a sinner. He's put his trust in Jesus, his Savior. The Holy Spirit has been given to him to dwell in him. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. AJ, a temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't come to this temple. This isn't the temple. This building is not the temple of God. You guys are. I am. So one of the roles of the Spirit is to live in you and give you power to live the Christian life, to understand the Scriptures, understand, like I shared a couple past couple Sundays, the times we live in. Let's be able to discern. How do we do that? The written Word. Who gave us the written Word? What's the role of the Holy Spirit? You see, yes, the communicator of God, if you will. I mean, the Father, Son, and Spirit also commu all communicate, but one of the powerful roles is to communicate truth to us humans. Let me back up a minute. The other beautiful account of power of the Holy Spirit, his role is the power giver, is in the, the, the creation account. It says, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. So, in the beginning means time. God established time, space, and mass. Heaven and earth, space, mass. Or matter. Then it's very interesting. The creation was still formless. God was still forming it and shaping it. And it says this, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, it wasn't hover like in a helicopter, but it means was shaking, vibrating, moving rapidly over the waters. What in the world is that all about? If you think about it, our, the, the atoms of this wood right here have energy, correct? The atoms are made up of energy, particles and all of that. The Holy Spirit at the time of creation was putting in energy into the creation to cause the atoms to hold together. Heat, light, all of those types of energy, God, through the agent of the Holy Spirit, put the power into the creation, the energy. It's amazing to think about all the energy that holds these atoms together. Uh, you know when they split the baseball size uh, uh, nuclear material? You know, the atom bombs. What did it do? Leveled cities. And that's just this much stuff. If you took all the power of all the atoms of everything in the creation, it's, we can't even imagine the power. But when God created, was he tired? No, that's, no, Scripture says he never grows tired or weary. Think of our God, how amazing he is. This is one of the roles of the Holy Spirit, who also, by the way, through his power, breathed out what? All Scripture. The power giver. What gives us power to understand that we're sinners? The word of God. Given to us, breathed out by the Holy Spirit. What gives us the power to understand that we need Jesus the Christ? The Holy Spirit, you see. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So can you pray to the Holy Spirit? Yes, he's God. You can pray to Jesus, the Father. You can pray to the Son. You can pray to Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're all one God. You can say, thank you, Holy Spirit, for your power in us as we live the Christian life. Thank you for the power of the word you gave to men who were sinners, by the way, right? Was Paul sinless? No. Was Malachi, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Moses, were they sinless? They were sinful men, but the Holy Spirit was powerful enough to give them the word of God and it wouldn't be corrupted by those guys' sinfulness. That, again, is a powerful miracle of God to bring us the word. Now, everything I say today, you will find detractors. Go find them. No, don't, don't go find them. <laughs> you can find them. They're out there. They will battle against everything that I'll share this Sunday and the Sundays to come. So you have to get into this and be convinced for yourself that God's word is legit. It's breathed out by the Holy Spirit. This is why this, important, this, this study today is important. Breathed out by God. So the other role of the Spirit, besides the power giver, is the, the communicator of the logos, the concept. Logos is concept, plan, um, the, the logos of God, the plan for saving the, the fallen man and creation. The Holy Spirit then, by his power and his communication, 
gave it to men, wrote it down, and we now have the word today. So that's the main, the main point there. Let me share with you another beautiful scripture here real quick. This one, I know it's a lot of color and a lot of stuff going on. But the blue, as you know, down here, this is uh, 2 Peter 2, by the way, or 1 and 2. Well, write the text down. Please do. Go home and read it for yourself. But I put the color in for our sake. What I want you to see first is the, the yellow-red. Knowing this, first of all, in the gray, that no prophecy of Scripture. Now, we understand what Scripture is by now, right? It's the Word of God. Prophecy uh, came from prophets, men where the Holy Spirit breathed out or gave them the words to write down or to speak to that people group. So the prophets gave a prophecy, and there's no prophecy of Scripture that come from, comes from someone's own interpretation. So let's take that off the table today. Some people will argue and say, well, that's just Moses' opinion. The books that Moses wrote are just his, his view. No, no, no. What's it tell us? Let's read on. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But those men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. There you go. That's a beautiful passage. If you ever like, get confused or doubt this, you go to 2 Peter and you see this in chapter 1. So the Holy Spirit carried these prophets and apostles along, giving them the words that they should speak for God and from God. They don't come from just some sinner's imagination. Let's go up in the green. <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, read all of it. But when we made known to you, we didn't come up with clever myths, Peter said. When we made known to you all the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And look at the next phrase. Eyewitnesses. So if someone says to you, well, it's just an old mythological book. No, no. No, these things were witnessed by eyewitnesses. Peter was one and many others. Verse 18, we ourselves heard this very voice of God born from heaven. For we were with him, Jesus, on the holy mountain. And we have the prof prophetic word more fully confirmed. Meaning there were prophecies about Jesus to come from the Old Testament. Peter and the other apostles, disciples, saw them happen in real time. The blue, we won't get into much today, but look down here. Peter contrasts all that. He contrasts true prophecy from the Holy Spirit with the blue, false prophets. They're going to introduce destructive heresies. They're going to deny Christ even. Swift destruction will come. And notice what it says in verse 2. Many will follow their sensuality. We think sensuality is just about sex, but it's not. Sensuality has to do with the senses, it's we humans are created for the senses, yes. But those senses, because we're fallen and sinful, will take over. And we begin to use our senses to try to make sense of the world instead of what? God's word. So this is an interesting point. The false prophets are, are already here. They're, they're well among us. They've been there every age, even back then, but they're well among us today. But they, they convince many to follow their sensual desires, what they can see and hear and feel and touch. And Don, what's Scripture say? Faith comes through understanding that it is not seen, but unseen, right? Learning that in Sunday school too. We have faith in things that are unseen. Jesus the Christ, the city of God, in the new Jerusalem of, of heaven. We don't see those things now. They're, we can't sensually feel them, touch them, see them. But we have to trust Christ. He goes on to say, in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. So see the contrast? Blue, false words versus the true words of God's prophets. And uh, where do we find, CJ, where do we find the, the words of the true prophets? You know this. It's right here, isn't it? We go here. But, but then there will be false prophets who will come along and they will take, it says, Jude says this, they will take the grace of God in here and they will pervert it into the sensual. So even though we have this, be very careful because there are people out there, false teachers, that will turn the word of God into use of, of sensual desires and, and drawing money to themselves and all of that. All right, so be aware. Back to the main rail, main path, is that these men were carried along by the Holy Spirit of God. So let's make a note of this. The official word of God is the collected works. It's complete. Nothing more needs to be added. One more caution about false teachers before we move on. You will hear people nowadays in modern times say, uh, I have received a fresh word from God. What do they mean by that? They're putting that on par with this. They're putting it on par with Scripture. And uh, they'll often share what God has told them. 
And oftentimes it has to do with uh, word of faith or any of these other false gospels. So be careful. Um, you, you know, if, if people meant this, listen, if they just meant this, well, today I was reading the Bible and I just figured something out that I didn't understand before and it's fresh to them, then just say so. Say that. But what they mean is, I have received like a prophet of old, I have received a fresh news that's on par with scripture and now I'm gonna share it with you. And I'm here to tell you that the canon of scripture, that is the collection of scripture is what? Open or closed? Closed. It's closed. This is it. And we had a good discussion last week. I think, Bill, you brought it up about certain other writings from ancient times. Those have been poured over and understood to be not the case. Gospel of Thomas, some of these other things, they've been understood to not be uh, the scriptures. Even the book of Enoch is not included in our Bibles, but Jude refers to the book of Enoch. Uh, so it's good commentary on understanding history, but we're going to stick with what? We're going to stick with this. Um, now let me show you this, all right? Here's why. Paul, Peter, John, they tell us that scripture would be complete and closed to further editions around 1900 plus years ago, once the written work of the New Testament was finished. And here's the first one from Paul. He goes on to talk about tongues and prophecies. And if, if, you, if you're just making a bunch of noise uh, and making a show for yourself, then it's worthless. He talks about love. And then he says this, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, that is speaking in foreign languages you don't know to share the gospel, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Now, no, time out. Ammon, does that mean all knowledge like math and science and God's word itself will disappear? Is that what it means there? No, you would say no. General knowledge is not what's in view here. It means special knowledge. So Sharon, these prophets like, let's say, Paul, or Peter, did they not receive special knowledge from God? There's the point, friends. When it says here that, that knowledge itself, prophecy and all of those things, knowledge, it will pass away. That's what it means. It means God speaking special revelation to a certain person, a certain man, and then he writes it down as scripture. That's what's being talked about there. Now look at what else it says. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. When, Jenny? That was right back in the, the early church, wasn't it? When Paul was on his missionary journey, he would speak over here, and he spoke to certain things. Barnabas was over here, and he was speaking to truths over here. And what this is saying is, there was a lot of speaking in various parts around, but when the perfect or the complete thing comes, by the way, in the Greek, it's the thing, it's not a person, but when the perfect thing comes, the partial will pass away. What do you all think that the perfect thing is? It's the completed word of God. It's all scripture. And once that was there, the rest was not needed. So what do we go to? Do we go to those people that claim today to be prophets? I am a prophet of God and I'm gonna tell you, I wouldn't do it. I would go to this. Go to churches and Bible studies and things that will proclaim God's word. Not their own tongues, not their own not special knowledge from God, not their own prophecies that they claim to have gotten fresh from God. Paul says, when the perfect thing comes, those partial things are, are done. So anyway, we have the canon of scripture. It's, it's complete. Peter did the same thing. May the grace and peace be multiplied to you. In the red, I put the things that apply to scripture, right? In the knowledge of God, what is that? Scripture. So in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, his divine power has granted to us what? Some things? All things. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, what about the green, Sharon? Sharon and I talk about the colors sometimes. The green, I know you love this word zoe too. Sharon loves the word zoe. The word life there is not bios. It's not like biological, Jenny. It means, zoe means the abundant life of eternal life. So the scriptures tell us what? Things that pertain to eternal life in the dark green and godliness, light green. The light green is now, surely that we are in Christ by faith, right? Then we desire to live our lives for who? For Christ. That's the light green. So Peter is telling us here, we have everything we need. Do we need anything else for life? 
John, eternal life? No, no, you get this too. We have everything we need to know. John knows he's a sinner. John knows of Jesus the Christ. I've seen you from this age on up. You've heard the truth. You get it. So, John, trusting in Christ towards Zoe life, my friend, right? Then also, though, God wants you to live a godly life. That means you apply what you learn here to, to serve Christ, to obey Christ. That's a light green. Look at the red that it finishes with, like bookends. It says, the knowledge of God. And then down here, through the what? Knowledge of him. So it's talking about scripture. We have everything we need in scripture. And then this one from John who wrote Revelation. Now there's kind of debate about this one. Some people think this warning applies to the whole Bible. Well, logically it does, but he is very specifically saying this. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of what? This book. So for sure it's Revelation but it certainly applies to all of scripture, but in this case and context, it's here. Look at the warning. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book, Revelation. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life. Wow. And in the holy city, which are described in this book. So again, we spent all those months in the blue section talking about the false teachers, the prosperity gospel of today. They're adding to scripture, friends. Adding the scripture, they're twisting it, adding, making it sensual. And John is warning those guys and us, don't do this. So back to the main path. The main path is this. We have everything we need. We need nothing else to know Christ, to know that we're sinners, and to know the way to eternal life. There's our point. Let's go back a minute to this verse, all right? And a couple more thoughts today. This thought here. No one can search. Now, it's good that we sang, this is our father's world. In general, we can see that there's a creator. You guys agree? Stevie, you agree with that? You would. If you look at the flowers, you think, wow, somebody amazing created that flower, correct? So this is our father's world. But let me say this statement up here. There is a general revelation of God in the creation, but this. No one can search in created nature to find God's specific divine plan to save humanity and the fallen creation. We cannot read, a, uh, well, there's bad grammar there. I messed up on my work there. We cannot read about it in the clouds. So Bill, can we look up in the clouds and see the fact that we're sinners and we need Jesus? Can you see that up there? I hope you say no. I'm just, I'm just messing with you. No, we can't. You can't read about that you're a sinner and you need Christ in the clouds. It's not there. You can't see it in the waves and you can't see it in the sunset. Even those things are beautiful. I get it. But that's not where we go to know the truth of our sin and our savior. All right, that's the point. And so here is more of the point we wanna see. God's divine truth could only come to the minds of his chosen human instruments, prophets and apostles, by God's direct revelation using what? Words. That's why we're so big here at Ripley Church. The word, the word, the word, the word is because this, these words that make up the word, the entire thing, is the way God chose to communicate to us these truths, okay? Pretty simple. And here's, um, well, let's not go there yet. I have a couple examples I'll just read to you. We'll put them on the screen. Listen to what God said to Jeremiah the prophet, one of God's prophets. And by the way, that green part says, God chose specific people to be prophets. You see that? In all of history, 6,000-ish years of history right now, he only selected a few. If you go back and you list out all the prophets and apostles, there ain't that many. He chose those men to write these words. Not me, not Don, not Denise, not any of us, but those men, all right? But to Jeremiah, he says this, behold, Jeremiah, I have put my words in your mouth. All right, it's one example. And we can also understand that God oversaw the accurate recording of his breathed out truth. He oversaw that. So that even a child could understand salvation. Now let's take a look at this quote. Dr. MacArthur says this, it is of utmost importance to understand that it is scripture that is inspired by God. Now hang with us here. Not the men divinely chosen to record it. So those men were not the source of it. Where's the source? Who's, who is the source, AJ? God himself, the Holy Spirit. Those men weren't like somehow extra special that God picked them. God picked them by his grace. He said, I'm picking you. I speak my words. 
So that's the point that he's making there. Let's move on. When speaking or writing apart from God's revelation, those men's thoughts and wisdom and understanding were just human. You see the point? And they were fallible. And another important point I put in the blue because it's, it's juxtaposed or opposed to God's revelation. They were not inspired in a sense that we commonly use uh, the term of people with extraordinary artistic or literary or musical genius. Uh, so a lot of times we'll say that those folks were inspired and we know what they mean by that. Uh, they have a real gift and they're inspired to do their, their art or music. Um, so people describe uh, maybe literature, art or music as that way. But let's remember that those things are not inspired directly by God, um, as if on par with Scripture. Uh, the men who wrote Scripture, like Moses and Paul, were they highly trained? What do you guys think? Was Paul highly trained? He was. Paul was. He was trained um, in, in grammar of the day. He was trained in the law. He was, a, he was a very bright man. That's why he wrote the way he did in the New Testament. Very bright man. But do you guys think it was his brightness? that added to the truth, of that like made the scripture truth? No, it wasn't Paul's brightness. It was from the, AJ said, mouthed it earlier. It was the Holy Spirit, right, AJ? But God used Paul as a vessel, as a means to communicate. Same with Moses. Friends, Moses was trained in the courts and the educational system of Egypt. He was a bright man, very bright. But it wasn't the brightness of Moses that brought us the divine truth. It was God himself using Moses as an instrument. Make sense? That's, I wanted to point that out. King David, a poet, very gifted poet, reflected in the beauty of his Psalms, yes, but his human talent was not the source of God's truth. It was God himself. So these truths must come from the outside, not within us, but outside of us, given to those men. And then God's plan is beyond the mind of man, and it wasn't understood until God showed us, right? So we're on the home stretch. Don't pack up your brains. Hang with me because it's a little bit more, but this is good. Listen to this. When asked the question, what's all Scripture good for then? It's good for. And in the color coding up there, you'll see the two colors that we talked about earlier. Salvation, the things to do with Zoe life, right, Sharon? And then also the equipping for Sharon then to go out and use her gifts and talents and abilities to serve not only in this church family, but she goes out and she serves with joy beyond. That's what's in view here. What's scripture good for? It, it prepares Sharon for salvation. Uh, the, the, it points her to Jesus. The, the, so the scriptures themselves don't save Sharon, but the truths in there lead her to Jesus who saves her. Salvation. And then she's equipped. So let's take a look here at, a, at a, another passage. Uh, I want to just do this exercise with you. So write this down. You see it here. Paul did it here. So the red is scripture, sacred writing and all scripture. And you see the two colors of green. Able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation. And then the green. At, we're going to get to the light green later on, coming up. So once you're saved, then scripture is also profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that... The man of God may be complete. Man or woman, we understand that's the universal man, but man and woman will be complete, equipped for every good work. Now that includes good deeds that you'll do for your neighbor, like go help him clean up storm damage. Yes, of course. But it also the, the good work of doing what? Sharing the gospel. Sharing the double-edged sword of the scriptures, right? The law of God in accordance with the, the gospel of God. That's also part of those good works. Yeah, it really does include all that. Now, it's interesting, in Sunday school, Don had been showing us where, we're in, in uh, Peter's writings, and he's showing us where Peter's writings parallel Paul's writings. There's a point for us. I put in my notes. Who is the inspiration of both? Holy Spirit. That's why all Scripture is compatible. It interweaves, it, it supports, it explains it communicates to us because the same Holy Spirit breathed out the truth to not only Paul, but to Peter and James and John and the rest that wrote for us. So we can go to Peter's writings. There's Paul's, there's the colors, and there's the concepts. Now let's go to Peter's writing just real quick. This is so good. Write it down and go home and do this for yourself. It's, it's a wonderful exercise. The red, of course, is scripture. It, it applies to scripture. You got the dark green of salvation, the light green of godliness or equipping. So let's look at it. 
in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, that's scripture, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to those two, salvation and equipping, life, godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great what? Promises. Promises to forgive our sin, to make us righteous by his righteousness, to promise us eternal life. And then look, it says, so that through them, what's the them? That's scripture still. Through those things, you may become partakers of the divine nature. And that means, of course, that we will be made like Christ. No longer prone to disease, no longer prone to death. We will be, have the mind of Christ. No more sin, Bill. We, you and I will no longer have temptations that will get us. We won't have those thoughts that we go, oh my, that was, that was bad, Right? We'll be made like Christ. We will have those things no longer. That's what that's saying right there. To participate in the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desire. There it is. But let's go on. For this very reason. What, what reason? Salvation. Because of salvation, you all make every effort to supplement your faith with these things. Virtue. Knowledge. Knowledge of what? What do you think? Knowledge of scripture, very good. I mean, other knowledge is fine. You need to know how to fix your car, but this is talking about understanding scripture. Add to that self-control, steadfastness. We learned that earlier, didn't we, from Paul? And now Peter. Godliness, brotherly affection, love, agape love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful. In what? The knowledge that you have of the word. Yeah, yeah. But look at the blue. Watch out, a warning. For whoever lacks these qualities in the light green is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. So it's really a call for us to, to add to, once we're saved by faith, dark green, we then want to live for Christ light green. And then we conclude with this. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent. Be diligent. Now notice this though, we gotta be careful because we're not talking about doing good works to be saved, correct? We know that's not true. But the light green, be more diligent, the light green is to do what? The yellow. Confirm your calling and election. And Don, you shared this in Sunday school. Does, does Paul and James contradict? Paul says you're saved by grace through faith, this not of works. But then James says, you tell me you have good works, I'll show you my faith by what I do. You're not in conflict. You're saved first by grace through faith, faith alone in Jesus alone. But then once you're saved, what? Your life ought to reflect, as James said, it ought to reflect that you have a faith in Christ. That's the dark green and the light green here. That's what confirm means. You're not saved by those works in the light green, but it confirms that you are saved and called. And then the rest, four, if, notice the conditional, conditional, if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. The reason for that is if you're, if you're intently on the, on the narrow path, Jenny, and you're pressing on, right? You're pressing on in knowing the word of God and deepening your faith in God, and then your life reflects that. Where are you headed? Where are you headed? You're headed forward, aren't you? You're headed toward Christ, our goal, right? Bill, that makes sense, doesn't it? That's what it means that you won't fall. If you're pressing on toward Christ, you're gonna keep on. You're gonna keep on keeping on. But if you look away and you look back to the world or your former ways, you're nearsighted so much so that you're blind and you're heading away from Christ. Don't do that. But being diligent in these practices will confirm that you are called and elect and then you won't fall off of that narrow path. For in this way, I put that back in the, in the red. That was a hard color to choose. <laughs> Sometimes it's tough. For in this way, what way? Ammon, the way laid out in the red is scripture. For in the way of scripture, there will be richly provided for you. Do you see that language there, Don? It's provided for you. Don won't save himself, dark green, can't save himself. His salvation is given to him through faith in Jesus the Christ. An entrance into the eternal kingdom, new Jerusalem, new Jerusalem, tangible city of God, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. And that's where we're gonna end because friends, this is, this section, this scripture here is the point. God's word is about your salvation and then your godliness, all right? So if you, and you say, man, that was a lot of colors, pastor. I could never do that. I will gladly give you a copy of the transcripts. But I encourage you guys, if you do this work, 
more and more scripture is going to just be like, that makes sense. And, and it helps me a ton. It just helps me so much. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, we just can't, we can't even say enough to say thank you. We just can't with words, <laughs> ironically. Uh, but we can, we can, uh, we can quote scripture that tells of the glories of the word of God, the principles of God, the truths of God. And Holy Spirit, we're so grateful that you carried these men along through Old and New Testament times to give us the word of God that gives us life and godliness. Thank you for this today. And I pray we will apply it to our hearts and go from here and minister as we can. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together as we close and sing, He, that is Jesus, is exalted. grateful today, Jesus, that you are at the right hand of the Father, exalted King. And we are so grateful that you are ruling from heaven even now, and that you are superintending the things going on in this world. Thank you for every soul that was here today in person and those online watching. I pray that each time we open our Bibles to read for ourselves or hear a sermon, that we will grow closer and closer to you, Jesus, and the, the magnificent Savior and King you are. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving the words of life to us. Father, thank you for your eternal, ultimate wisdom uh, to lay out the logos, the plan, the concept of the word, logos, <laughs> who is Jesus in flesh, the logos of God, to come to save us from our sins. And so we thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit, for your, your role in our salvation. And thank you for being with everyone through the storm again. We're so grateful. Could have been so much worse then help us to continue to try to help others as we can to recover. But most of all, if people are vulnerable, we help them and then we share the truth as we're able. Thank you for this day of worship. And as we go, may we um, bring glory to you through this week in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>